discuss postdoctoral opportunities in much detail, but I'll try to give a little bit of information towards the end. We're going to begin with a quick overview of the city, of the university's particular strengths in research and course-based programs, a few examples of the programs available. We'll also offer some advice on application and admission, and finish with a little bit of information about life outside the classroom, where students have some of their most rewarding experiences. My name is Rory McEwen, and I work at the School of Graduate Studies in International Admissions. I'll be telling you more about what sets the University of Toronto apart from other universities in Canada, and then I'll talk about the different programs on offer and how to apply. The university benefits in many ways from its location in Toronto, Canada's largest city. When U of T was founded in 1827, the city looked very different from today. When the first buildings of the university were built, the chosen site was at the far northern edge of the town of York, and much of what is now our downtown campus was farmland. Since then, as you can see, quite a lot has changed. York was renamed Toronto and has grown to be Canada's largest city. From a small colonial town, it's come to have a population of several million. It's a vital, exciting metropolis, and its citizens come from all over the globe. The university benefits from its location here, as our student body is among the most diverse in the world, and the various communities of Toronto provide a home base and home community for our students. Students benefit from the urban setting. Only steps from campus, they can enjoy theater, opera, concerts, ballet, one of the world's leading film festivals, and food from any culture you can imagine. Within a short subway or streetcar ride, you can find any cuisine from across the world. We won't lie, Toronto is an expensive place to live, but the benefits are enormous. We're now Canada's, sorry, we're now North America's fourth largest city and the largest city in Canada. Uh, we follow Mexico City, New York, and Los Angeles. Remember, please, that Mexico City is North America's largest city. Uh, the city itself has just under 3 million residents, but the greater Toronto area has a population of nearly 6 million people. And we have campuses both in the East End, West End, and downtown of Toronto. Despite that, it remains one of the world's most livable cities, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit. Toronto's green spaces link together, creating what has been described as a city in a forest. Its transit system means that most people living downtown don't need a car, relying instead of on subway, streetcar, and buses. And those people come from all over the world. Our multicultural population means that you can find a cultural community no matter where you're from. More than 50% of our residents are from a visible minority population. The city, as in the government of the city, takes this seriously. It offers services and resources in up to 160 languages. And it's one of the most welcoming places in the world for LGBTQ students, with one of the largest pride festivals in North America every summer. As I was saying, if you're passionate about those food, those multicultural communities, you need to find amazing restaurants. Greek, Korean, Chinese, Brazilian, Italian, Indian, Ethiopian, just name the culture and you can find it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the university uses that diversity to the benefit of its students. Because that diversity means that Torontonians usually get along with each other. The city is famously tolerant and open-minded. We also have a very, very low crime rate. In 2017, The Economist ranked the world's major cities for safety, and Toronto placed fourth, safer than Melbourne, Amsterdam, Hong Kong, or Stockholm. Also, if you're considering living in Canada after graduation, Toronto is one of the best places for young people to start their careers. Again, going to The Economist, in 2015, they ranked Toronto as one of the world's best economies for young people. The city has a very strongly diversified economy. It's the headquarters of Canada's five largest banks. It's home to a thriving medical science industry, alongside arts, environmental design, fashion, film, and business and consulting services. Let's take a quick look at how the University of Toronto measures up to other universities in Canada and around the world. Before we start this part of the talk, I want to emphasize Canada's universities overall are top-notch. There are very good universities across the country. 
And in choosing a university, you want to choose the university that fits your needs best. The rankings are a way of seeing who's doing what, how much research output is there, what support is there for students. But you may find the program that you really want outside of a top ranked university, and that's okay. But we are, I think, justifiably proud of how U of T does in the international rankings. We're widely recognized as one of the world's great institutions of higher learning. And while different university rankings can't agree on how good we are, they all recognize us as one of the top research institutions in the world and one of the very best public research universities. As you can see, different respected university rankings have placed U of T consistently among the world's top research institutions over the past several years. But as a student, you might not be interested in the overall numbers. You want to know how U of T fits your needs. I'll take a look at just a few more statistics, and then I'll start to tell you a little bit about campus resources. In a key measure, U of T is ranked third in the world for research output after Harvard and Stanford. This means that our faculty members are world leaders in producing research that is used and referenced by other experts from around the world. But there are two ways to measure a university's research productivity. One is by the number of publications by its faculty, while the other is how often those publications are cited. If you look simply at how many papers U of T faculty publish, we rank second, just behind Harvard University. If you measure how often other researchers around the world refer to our research, then we rank third. Either way, this means that U of T students are working with some of the most widely respected researchers in their field. And that translates into results after graduation. Going abroad to university is an investment, and you'll be glad to know that U of T grads are ranked 12th overall in the world in finding work on graduation. When it comes to public universities, we do even better. Our grads are eighth in the world when it comes to landing good jobs after graduation. If you compare us to other public institutions, universities of excellence, such as UCLA, Cambridge, Tsinghua, or ETH Zurich. One of the biggest benefits we have is that we are fully affiliated with nine research teaching hospitals. The research carried out at those hospitals is driving advances in surgery, rehabilitation medicine, and pharmaceutical sciences. And U of T, it's, or sorry, Toronto itself, is becoming a major global hub for reproductive technology. We're in a large, diverse city, and we have large and diverse campuses. Our university has in the West End, U of T Mississauga, surrounded by green space and golf courses. In the East, U of T Scarborough sits on the edge of beautiful forested ravine. And in the center of it all, right downtown, is St. George campus. Students often get confused and ask which campus they'll be studying at. Uh, that's largely determined by what program you choose to take. Historically, graduate programs have been based on the St. George campus downtown. The St. George campus is home to many of the university's research resources, including the Robarts Library. It's also home to a number of professional faculties. Students in law, social work, education, or architecture will definitely be studying downtown. The St. George campus is a mix of historic buildings and brand new facilities. Visitors are often surprised at how green the campus is. But remember, when the university was founded, we were outside of the city. And the city's grown up around us, preserving a lot of the green space on the university campus. I really love this image. This is from a, a lunar eclipse viewing. And it really gives you a sense of the oasis of green in the middle of Toronto with tall office buildings around it, forming a really dramatic backdrop. Students in the humanities and social sciences take their graduate courses at the downtown campus. But they'll often take on roles as teaching assistants at U of T Scarborough or U of T Mississauga. Students in most programs in the physical and life sciences will do their coursework downtown, but since they conduct their research in their supervisor's labs, they may be researching at any one of the three campuses. The University of Toronto Scarborough is home to graduate students from many science departments as they research in their supervisor's labs. The campus also hosts three individual graduate departments, physical and environmental science, accounting and finance, and psychological clinical science. Students in those three programs will take their courses at U of T Scarborough. It's about an hour from downtown campus uh, by public transit. It's a welcoming and diverse community, 
and it's been growing steadily over the last years, adding new facilities to accommodate its students. The campus benefits from athletic facilities built to host the Pan Am Games, including a world-class aquatic center. To the west, the Institute for Management and Innovation at U of T Mississauga is the main driver of graduate studies at the UTM campus. IMI offers master's programs in sustainability management, forensic accounting, management and professional accounting, and management and innovation. They also play host to a number of students in research-driven programs working in their supervisor's labs. The UTM campus is connected to downtown by a shuttle bus operated by the university. Students in programs based at Mississauga can take the shuttle bus for free, while students from downtown pay a $6 fare either way. It keeps the University of Toronto Mississauga connected to downtown and provides a haven for its students in suburban, Toronto, in suburban Mississauga with beautiful landscaping and just a little touch of the wild which is handy because it's not just students that call UTM home. If you show up early enough in the morning, you may catch sight of deer grazing. But even that's not the whole story. Students in aerospace studies are in laboratories at Downsview and the north end of the city. Our astronomy students travel as far afield as Chile or Antarctica to observe the skies at partner institutions observatories. And our chemistry students frequently go to the high Arctic to collect atmospheric samples. Here you can see students from our Earth Sciences Department in the field on the other side of the world, a geology research trip to New Zealand. So just what kind of students do we have and what are they studying? The University of Toronto offers more than 280 graduate degree programs across 85 graduate departments. Just as important as that breadth of programs, though, is our focus on interdisciplinary research, as faculty members and students from separate programs work on projects that cut across the disciplines. As I speak more, you'll get to understand that graduate study at U of T is strongly decentralized. Each department is managing their own excellent programs, and we leave it to the experts to determine how that's to be managed. But what are our areas of strength? Well, in regenerative medicine, we make a, this is a really good example. Researchers at the Institute for Medical Science collaborate with the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute, the Department of Phy Pharmaceutical Sciences, the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering to solve key questions and help patients recover from traumatic injuries or illnesses. You'll often find faculty members and students from numbers of departments working together on the same project. Here's just one example. Professor Molly Chauchet, Canada Research Chair, is cross-appointed to the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry, the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering, the Department of Chemistry, and the Institute of Medical Science. Those four departments are part of three separate faculties, Applied Science and Engineering, Medicine, and Arts and Science. In other areas, we're world leaders in machine learning and artificial intelligence. As a result of this, U of T graduates are some of the most sought after in industry, with our graduates going on to work with Microsoft, Apple, Google, Samsung, Facebook. Professors in departments such as computer science and computer engineering, and even aerospace studies are teaching computers to teach themselves how to analyze big data, to analyze the human genome, or to fly drones in remote locations. In addition to the strengths of our faculty members, we also benefit from our location. The Toronto Stock Exchange is the world's 12th largest, and as I mentioned, we're headquarters to Canada's main banks. U of T researchers are world leaders as a result in financial technology. This includes emerging fields such as cybersecurity for online transaction or analysis of big data. We are also a leader in urban studies as more than 220 faculty members across different departments focus on urban issues, whether they're in geography and planning, management or other programs, uh, University of Toronto researchers are providing thought leadership on how to improve and redesign cities. The Department of Geography and Planning Sorry about that, let's go back a slide. The Department of Geography and Planning is recognized globally for the work of its urban geographers, 
and their Master of Science in Planning is an extremely competitive program. We also have a long established record, record of global leadership and research in fields related to energy, environment, climate change, sustainability, clean technology, and biofuels. In the past five years, in the past five years alone, we've had over 125 clean tech and renewable energy patents filed by University of Toronto researchers. We're a global leader on biofuels, climate change, and sustainability. UT is also a hub for advanced materials and manufacturing research and tests new ideas that have the potential to boost productivity, save money, and reduce environmental impact. U of T professors are also world leaders in advanced materials and manufacturing technology with deep expertise in areas such as nanomaterials, robotics, and three-dimensional printing. But any university is only as good as its professors and only as good as its students. U of T is Canada's largest graduate school with over 18,000 graduate students. More than 3,000 of those students are international and we'd like that proportion to be even higher. International students come to questions in the social sciences and humanities with very different perspectives from those of Canadian students. And in all disciplines, the University of Toronto is actively building partnerships with universities around the world to collaborate on research projects and to share knowledge. That's what international students have to offer U of T. But what do we have to offer you? The University of Toronto is equipped with superb research facilities across all disciplines, whether on campus, at remote sites, or in collaboration with international partner institutions. U of T faculty and students participate in uh, particle physics research at CERN on the French Swiss border, the facility that houses the Large Hadron Collider. In conjunction with our nine partner hospitals, our Faculty of Medicine has research facilities that no other university in Canada can possibly match. As an example, the Donnelly Centre for Cellular and Biomolecular Research, opened in 2005, has long been a leader in gene sequencing. The University of Toronto has such resources in the field that even undergraduate students here can have the opportunity to use cutting-edge CRISPR gene editing technology. Where other institutions are happy if they can sequence a gene, our students, our undergraduate students, are actively editing genes. In 2015, the Canadian government announced a grant of $114 million to help the university begin the Medicine by Design initiative to further the development of regenerative medicine, synthetic biology, and computational biology. And this is supported by an amazing library system. Our library system is the third largest in North America, behind Harvard and Yale. Our 43 libraries have more than 19.5 million physical holdings. That means books, journals, atlases, government records, maps, and over 5.8 million electronic holdings. As a result, our students have access to more research publications than they would at any other school in Canada. And those publications are more up to date. We have access to journals that are publishing at the bleeding edge of research in fields across all disciplines. Our Department of Computer Science is justifiably famous, but the university has also innovated uh, computing in other fields. The Faculty of Arts and Science founded CHAS, Computing in the Humanities and Social Sciences, back when the internet was still new. Its data center provides analysis of statistical data provided by Statistics Canada and services for analyzing stock market trading to the private sector. And just as the Faculty of Medicine has launched projects and created centers for research over multiple disciplines, our scholars in the humanities and social sciences have built research collaborations in different areas, such as women and gender studies, comparative literature, Renaissance studies, or medieval studies. In all these fields, just what kind of options are available for students? Let's start off talking about professional master's programs. Professional master's programs last usually from one to three years. Our, our briefest program, the Master of Financial Risk Management, is an eight-month program. They're usually course-based and prepare students for careers in certain fields or to hold certain designations. For example, if you want to practice as a social worker, you do need a degree in social work. That's where the, M the MSW comes in. Many of our programs include internships or co-op placements with off-campus private sector partners. Um, 
Usually, though, these programs are not funded. Students are expected to fund the funding themselves, whether it's through external scholarships, student loans, or government-funded scholarships from their home country. Moving on to research-based masters, we offer a master, master of Arts programs in Humanities and Social Sciences. We offer Masters of Science in Physical and Life Sciences, and Masters of Applied Science in, faculty, in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. These programs usually take one to three years to complete, and very often they'll have a thesis component. Certainly the Master of Science and the Master of Applied Science always have a thesis project that the student prepares under the supervision of a faculty member. It prepares students to contribute to the world of academic research. These programs, in keeping with the University of Toronto's research focus, are often funded. Master of Science programs and Master of Applied Science programs are funded by the departments hosting them. In the humanities and social sciences, it's a bit less predictable. Some departments provide funding for their master's students. Some departments provide partial funding, whereas others choose instead to focus their funding on PhD students. Let's talk about those PhD students. Usually a doctoral degree will take four to five years to complete, although the SJD in law is usually a three-year program. Usually these are only available to students who already hold a master's degree, but students who've performed extremely well in undergraduate can sometimes be admitted directly from undergraduate. Almost all doctoral programs are funded for between three and five years, but that will vary from program to program. In the humanities and social sciences, that funding usually takes the form of a mixture of direct grant scholarship, which is tax exempt, and pay as a teaching assistant. So our students in the humanities and social sciences aren't just studying, they're gaining experience as teachers that should help them if they're able to pursue faculty positions as their career. In the sciences, usually that funding comes as a mixture of direct grant scholarship, again, tax-free, uh, and a research stipend as a research assistant in their supervisor's lab. As you can imagine, in the sciences, it's therefore important to look for potential supervisors as you apply. We also offer something else that most other universities don't. These are called collaborative specializations. These aren't degree programs. Uh, they are taken by students during the course of their degree. They involve collaboration between different disciplines. So students who are housed in different departments meet with students from other departments in classes and on research projects in order to address specific topics. Let me give you an example. Uh, the Addiction Studies program accepts students who are in degree programs in community health, criminology, information, medical science, nursing, pharmaceutical sciences, and many others. And all these students take a joint seminar together, a graduate seminar on addiction studies and interdisciplinary approaches to it. For the rest of their degree, they pursue elective courses that tie in with addiction studies. And if they're in a thesis-based program, their thesis should be on the topic of addiction. When they finish, they graduate not only with their degree, whether it's a Master of Social Work or a PhD in Medical Science, or a Master of Health Science and Community Health, but they also have a certification in addiction studies. As another example, students are often very surprised to find out that U of T does not have a graduate program, graduate degree program rather, in neuroscience, but we have some of the world's leading neuroscientists. They're just housed in departments such as medical science, physiology, cell and systems biology, psychology, but students from those departments are able to take courses in their own program and do a collaborative specialization in neuroscience. So what's it going to take to get in? Remember first and foremost that the university is very decentralized. Program details and deadlines will vary from department to department. You're going to want to review your program choice very, very carefully to decide whether or not it's right for you. Just as an example, I get a lot of students inquiring about our Master of Biotechnology program. When I talk with them a little bit further, it turns out that they're really interested in biomedical engineering. and I'm able to refer them to the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. The Master of Biotechnology is a program that sits on the border between business and science. So if you just go by the program name, you might 
make a wrong choice. You want to review what are profs doing in that department? What courses is that department offering? Is it really the right fit for you? You also want to review the admission requirements and determine whether or not you meet them. The School of Graduate Studies sets university-wide requirements, but individual programs may have higher requirements than others. For instance, to apply to psychology, you need an average of at least A minus. Other programs may be lower. Remember to start early. You want to make sure that you give yourself time to write a good application and give yourself and your referees time to really make sure that every detail of the application is as it should be. Admissions decisions are made at the level of the individual graduate units. Remember I said we have 280 graduate programs, over 85 graduate units. It's those individual units that are actually making the decision. So whether it's a department, a center, or an institute, they'll be the ones who actually make the decision on who, get, on who gets in and who doesn't. What are the admission requirements? Okay, School of Graduate Studies sets university-wide minimums, and as I said, individual programs may have more stringent standards. In order to get into a master's program, the cutoff that each department will look at is the average in your final year. So that's not your cumulative average over the course of your degree, it's the average of the last year's worth of courses. University-wide, to get into a master's program, you have to have the equivalent of a B from the University of Toronto to meet the minimum admission requirements. Remember though, admission is competitive. Every department gets more applicants, more qualified applicants than they have spaces for. In some cases, many times more applicants than they have spaces. So simply meeting the minimum admissions requirements won't guarantee admission. For admission to a PhD, usually you need to hold a master's degree with at least a B plus average. Or if you're an undergraduate student considering direct admission to a PhD, you'd need to have an A minus average. Now, those are marks expressed in terms that are familiar to U of T students. On the School of Graduate Studies website, we have a credentials equivalencies tool where you can look up the country where you received your previous degree and see how their grading scale matches up against the U of T requirements. Students who are educated internationally do need to submit IELTS or TOEFL scores. Uh, and they have to meet certain minimum requirements. University-wide, it's a 7 on the IELTS or a 93 on the TOEFL, but several departments and programs actually have much higher requirements than that. So make sure you review the individual department's requirements. All departments will also require at least two reference letters. Some will ask for three. At least one has to be an academic reference and some programs will insist on them all being academic. Some professional programs, such as the Master of Social Work, ask for one professional and one academic. So make sure you review the requirements carefully to make sure that you're asking the right referees for your program. There can be additional requirements too. Some programs ask students to write standardized tests, such as the GRE or the GMAT, and they may need you to submit scores. Some course-based programs may be happy with just a statement of intent, whereas others will want a research proposal. Again, make sure to check the requirements carefully. And some programs, especially in the sciences, will want you to have a prospective supervisor who's interested in supervising your study. So how does the process work? First, I say again, confirm that you meet the, the admission requirements for the program. And remember that meeting those minimum requirements does not guarantee admission. If your program requires a supervisor, make sure you reach out early to prospective supervisors. The application process is online, usually through the School of Graduate Studies website. There's an application fee of at least $120. Some programs, it's a little higher. And once you've paid the fee, you're able to upload supporting documents for your application, and the application system sends a request to your referees so they can submit their reference online. It's very, very important to note the deadlines and to apply on time. As I said, most programs are receiving many more applications than they have spaces, so there's no incentive for them really to consider a late application. Let's talk a little bit about finding a supervisor. U of T is a research-focused university, 
and some Master of Science, Master of Applied Science, and PhD programs mean you will require that you have to find a willing supervisor as part of the application process. Even for programs that don't require a supervisor for admission, if you're going into a research-based program where there's a thesis, it's a really good idea to be in contact with a, with a prospective supervisor or two to get a sense of the department, find out what kind of projects are accepted, and possibly line the supervisor up for your own studies. And the research you do on this really matters. Every department provides at least some information about all their faculty members and research interests on their website. Check those faculty biographies online. Go to your own university's library and look up those professors' publications. Read the kind of research that they're doing, the kind of information they're publishing in journals, and see if it's the kind of work that you want to do. And then make sure you understand your program's process for assigning a supervisor. I'll give an example. International students applying to the Institute of Medical Science need to have a supervisor lined up at the time of application. And in fact, the supervisor has to submit a letter confirming that they're prepared to fund the student. In the Department of Immunology, though, there are rotations. Students are admitted to the program and spend a few months in different supervisors' labs and secure a supervisor through the rotation process. Let's take a few examples that I've taken on screenshots from online. Here's part of the website of the Department of Molecular Genetics, providing links to faculty biographies for each, of the, for each of their professors. Just as an example, because I enjoy the lab's website, let's take a look at Professor Charles Boone. If you can see my mouse on this, you see he's got a link to his home lab so you can find out exactly what they're working on. It tells you where's education, it tells you what's of particular interest to him, it says he's accepting rotation students so that students who apply to the program for next year can be assigned to a rotation in his lab. And let's see what happens when we click the link to the Boone Lab. I always love showing this to students because they've gone with a yellow submarine theme, um, but also because the Boone Lab is very upfront. Here's what they say. We are looking for talented graduate students and postdocs interested in computational analysis of yeast functional genomics data. A strong background in computational biology is desired. Exceptional interest in understanding yeast biology and a great sense of teamwork are essential. So Professor Boone here is laying out really clearly the kind of student that they're looking for. Someone with a strong background in biology, but also in computation. If you don't have that, it's probably not the lab that you want to work in. I think it also gives you a sense of the personality of the lab to take a look at the website. Let's talk a little bit about funding. As I suggested before, professional master's programs, the course-based master's programs, are usually not funded. So it's really important to explore your options from government scholarships, loans, or other options. Master of Arts programs may or may not be funded. As an example, the Department of Philosophy finds funding for its MA students, but in English, they've opted instead to provide five years of funding for their PhD students rather than four. Masters of Science and Master of Applied Science programs, as I said, are usually funded, usually through direct grant scholarship and a research stipend. But students are still expected to apply for external funds. There are government scholarships offered by the Canadian and the Ontario government that students are expected to apply for to help supplement their aid package. And students from international, international students are strongly encouraged to investigate the opportunities offered by their home government. We also have arrangements for visiting students and for joint supervision. Let's talk a little bit about both of those. The International Visiting Graduate Student Program is open to all international graduate students interested in conducting research at the University of Toronto. You must be enrolled in a graduate degree program at your home institution. You can't be in a diploma program. You can't be a recent graduate. You have to be in a master's or PhD program at a recognized university. Students who find a supervisor can then come for a research visit of four, eight, or 12 months. Students don't pay tuition here. We assume they're paying tuition back home, but they do pay the incidental fees for full access to research and recreational facilities and to student services such as health and wellness, family care, and immigration advice. 
Here's one of our recently finished visiting students, Fabio, who came to us from Brazil to work on research in dentistry. Uh, he was here for about a year and has only recently returned home. There's also life outside the classroom, and this is very important. It's important to maintain a healthy balance between your studies, your physical health, and your mental health. And we take this very seriously at the University of Toronto. Our student life supports almost 900 campus clubs for interests that range from archery to bowling to chess. I suddenly realized I'm going in alphabetical order there. Uh, but we have anything from investment to scuba diving to debate. Our debating team regularly wins the National North American Championship. We also have a place you can call home. There's Graduate House, a residence dedicated entirely to graduate and second entry students. Uh, the only students allowed to live there are in graduate programs or what we call second entry programs like law, pharmacy, or medicine. Here is a shot of what Graduate House looks like. And it really does give you that sense of the university being right in the middle of downtown Toronto. We also have Heart House. Heart House is modeled on the Oxford Union, so people from all divisions of the university are members. Students administer most of the day-to-day -day business of Heart House, including 10 standing committees, debate, social justice, music, library, etc. They have a number of student clubs. They have no, less, no fewer than three choirs. They have a symphony, a symphonic band, and a jazz ensemble. We also have very active athletics uh, for our students, for a healthy mind and a healthy body. Uh, we have athletic facilities on all three campuses, including highlights such as the Aquatic Center that I showed you earlier at Scarborough. The Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sport and the Varsity Center are on St. George campus and are operated by our faculty of kinesiology, physical and health education. Hard House itself has a glorious antique gym it's not much fun in summer because there's no air conditioning, but the other gyms are air conditioned. And we have intramural and varsity sports. There are plenty of opportunities for organized sport on one of the university's varsity teams or in one of its many intramural leagues. But there's also a lot of opportunity for informal sport. You never know when the engineers are gonna show up for a snowball fight or when they'll take over front campus and create their own hockey rink outside in winter. Let's be very honest, you need something like that to encourage you to get outside and get some fresh air in a Canadian winter. We also provide support for students in a more academic sense. The School of Graduate Studies operates the Graduate Centre for Academic Communication. It's got three full-time teaching stream faculty members. That's the director, Jane Freeman on the left, Rachel Cayley and Peter Graff. They are full-time teaching staff at the University of Toronto. And they specialize in teaching students about how to communicate the results of their research. They've got a range of supports. So they offer courses and workshops. Workshops can be just two hours, one off, really simple. Courses can be two hours a week for six weeks, but they help students international and domestic students, and at all levels of English proficiency. For new arrivals, they have an academic conversation skills class, two hours a week for six weeks to help you learn the skills you need to speak up and take an active part in your seminar courses. They have both workshops and courses on how to write grant proposals. So when you're applying for scholarships, how do you write the proposal? What does it look like? These courses will help you. They have courses on editing your own work, so you can get a, a paper that you've written for a class ready for publication as a journal article. And they have a number of workshops and courses on oral presentation skills. The School of Graduate Studies also provides uh, the Graduate Professional Skills Program, including the three-minute thesis competition, which you're seeing a picture from here. The Graduate Professional Skills Program, or GPS, provides programs and workshops for students to develop key skills in four different areas. Research competency. A lot of these courses are offered by the U of T library system. The upside, we have a brilliant library system. The downside, it's so huge, you really need training to find stuff in it. 43 campus libraries and millions of holdings take advantage of these courses. 
We also offer teaching, so we also offer training and teaching skills. Remember, most humanities and social sciences students at the PhD level will be acting as teaching assistants or occasionally teaching their own courses, and we provide training for that. More generally, communication skills, such as oral presentation skills or writing. A lot of these offerings are given by the Graduate Center for Academic Communication. And we also offer courses in personal management and effectiveness. This can range from a two hour workshop on how to beat procrastination to a weekend long mini MBA program or even a certificate program in project management. A lot of my colleagues will tell you that these programs are free. They're not. They're paid for by student fees though. So any student who uses these has already paid for them through their student fees. There's no additional charge. The Office of Student Life also provides health services, career education, and specialized services for international students. From orientation events aimed at our international students to language practice, uh, immigration advice for students who want to stay in Canada after they graduate, the Center for International Experience makes sure that our diverse students feel at home. The goal, remember, is to get students to this date. This is Convocation Hall on the day of one of our convocations. And the students you see there in black and red are PhD students about to be given their doctoral degrees. That's our goal for you. That's what we want to support our students in. That's the end game. So let's move to a question and answer session. Remember, if we don't get to a question that you have today, or if you're too shy to ask, you can always email us at sgs.international.utoronto.ca, and we'll be happy to help you. Let me just take a look at through what questions we have. Okay, so the first question, uh, I mentioned nine research hospitals, and the question is, are those hospitals in your campus? That is a good question. Uh, some of them are very, very close by, while some are a bit more of a commute. Uh, in this slide, actually, in this picture, although you wouldn't necessarily be able to make each of them out, but within this picture, you can see um, the St. George campus, the green area, that is U of T, and then to its south, between us and the lake, are Toronto General Hospital, the Hospital for Sick Children, Princess Margaret Hospital, which is a, a cancer specialization hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, just off the slide to the right is Toronto Western Hospital, and Sunnybrook, uh, Sunnybrook Hospital is about a 40 to 45 minute commute by subway and bus, a little bit faster if you're driving. Here we go. Is there any age limit on students? No, absolutely not. The University of Toronto accepts students of all ages. Back in 2002, when I started graduate study in English, I was 22 years old, and my favorite classmate was 73. Father John Geary was a, a retired high school principal and Catholic priest, and he joked on that first day that he'd earned his master's degree in the year that our professor was born. So no, no age limits. What else have we got? What are our English language requirements? Okay, as I mentioned, um, I should give a bit more information here though. Um, our minimum TOEFL requirement is a score of 93 overall, but your writing and speaking scores have to be at least 22 to meet our admission requirements. Uh, some programs, the Faculty of Information, for instance, uh, require higher. They actually require 100 on TOEFL. IELTS, uh, the overall score has to be 7, with no individual band below 6.5. And I'm sometimes asked by students if their overall score on two separate tests is 7, and on one test one band was low but they did better on another test, can they mix and match the results from two different tests? The answer, unfortunately, is no. And remember, individual units may have higher admission requirements. Rebecca is asking whether we have a master's degree program in communication. Uh, we don't have a graduate department of communication, so there was no master's as just master of arts or master of science in communication. Uh, but students, the faculty of information, doing the master of information, are working on research topics that would not be out of place in a department of communication. Um, the Knowledge Media Design Institute is strongly communications oriented. But no, there's no one program in general communications. We do have a very highly specialized 
a very competitive program in biomedical communications offered by the Institute of Medical Science. Do we admit part-time students who are international? Well, usually students who are coming to Canada specifically to study will enroll in full-time studies to finish as soon as possible. We obviously do have students who moved to Canada for work, then decided they'd like to get a further qualification, or uh, who decide once they're already here, and many of them will choose to study part-time so that they can keep working. But usually, if, if you're coming here specifically for study, no, it's, it's full-time study. Marcia is asking whether our programs automatically include an English course. The answer is no. The School of Continuing Studies offers an academic English course, and students can use that to meet the English language requirements for admission. We see a lot of students who come to Toronto to learn English through that program and then decide to do graduate study here and, and apply that way, but it's not an automatic part of the degree. Most of our international students who apply simply have scores from TOEFL or IELTS that meet the minimum requirements. Once students are here, though, there are opportunities, even if they're not formal courses, for students to, uh, to, to develop and practice their English skills. As I mentioned, the Graduate Centre for Academic Communication has an introductory academic conversation skills class. Uh, the Office of Student Life offers what they call English communication communities for graduate students, where multilingual graduate students get together to practice their English without any undergrads around. And there are a lot of other opportunities on and off campus for students who want to improve their English skills. Miguel wants to know whether to apply if he doesn't meet the minimum admission requirements. As I said, most of our programs are highly competitive. If you don't meet the minimum requirements, the best approach is to contact the department offering the program you're interested in and ask what additional undergraduate courses would serve to make your application more competitive. Luz Maria Allende wants to know whether there are any university-wide or national scholarships to apply for as an international student. The answer is yes, but they're very, very few. They're aimed at the research programs rather than professional or course-based programs. And they really are aimed at absolutely top-notch applicants. For most of the international awards, um, international students can apply for the Ontario Graduate Scholarship for International Students. It's very competitive. Um, and awards that are given out by the federal government for international students, a student can't simply apply by themselves. They actually have to be nominated first by their home department. Then there's a university-wide competition to be sent on to, um, to the government. And then the government scholarship bureau runs their own uh, competition with those. I'd strongly encourage you to take a look at the Graduate Awards Office website. Uh, our website is www.sgs.utoronto.ca and from there you can link to Graduate Awards. Uh, Irma Gutierrez is asking about doing research on education and society. Um, again, just as I was talking about for neuroscience or addiction studies, yes, we have researchers working on these topics, but they're not necessarily going to be all in the same department. Um, there, will, there are definitely people working on this at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, that's our Faculty of Education, um, and also in the Department of Sociology, which is part of the Faculty of Arts and Science. Again, if you're trying to decide which of these programs is the best fit for you, take a look at the courses offered by each department. Take a look at the supervisors, the faculty members working in those departments and what their research areas are. And based on that information, determine do you want to go for, to education or do you want to apply to sociology? A different Miguel wants to know whether there are exchanges at the graduate level. The answer is yes. We have partner institutions all over the world uh, where students, uh, where our students can go for a semester or two and their students in exchange come here. Um, I'm currently in the middle of reviewing exchange applications from our partner schools, and I've got about 60 incoming master's exchange students. Uh, the difficulty on this is we have to have an existing partnership with the school that the student's registered at, and we don't have a lot of partners in Latin 
America. Uh, we've actually found it quite difficult where the semesters don't align with ours to arrange exchanges. We have exchange partners in Australia and New Zealand, but because their school year is so different from ours, they're not as well used as we'd like. Um, but as I also was mentioning, the International Visiting Graduate Student Program provides the opportunity for research visits for students from any university at all worldwide, as long as it's recognized by your local Ministry of Education or whichever body accredits universities where you are. If you're a registered graduate student at one of those institutions and can find a host supervisor at U of T, anyone's welcome. Carlos is asking about the difference between writing a statement of intent and writing a research proposal. That's a really good question. Um, a statement of intent is a fairly broad category of a piece of writing. Uh, it's where you explain to a department what you hope to accomplish in their program. Uh, in a course-based program, it may be explaining the courses that are of particular interest to you and why. Uh, it may be referring to the department's particular research strengths and why those interest you. A research proposal is a kind of a statement of intent. It's just much more narrow in focus. A uh, research proposal is a very specific outlining of a single project that you hope to finish as your thesis. So many statements of intent will include within them research proposals, and research proposals are much more detailed. I think we're coming to the end here. Oh, no, here we go. Um, okay, as I mentioned at the start, we're not really able to offer much information on postdoctoral opportunities. Um, even more so than graduate study, postdoctoral opportunities are really decentralized at U of T. Even within departments, opportunities will vary from supervisor to supervisor. So professors working on research projects may have the funding to hire postdoctoral assistants to work on their projects. This is much more common in the sciences than the humanities or social sciences. If these positions are advertised, it's either on the project website, the lab website, or on the department's website. In most cases, it's advisable to look for online for professors working in your field and contact them to inquire whether any positions are likely to open in the near future. There is no one centralized place to go and find a supervisor. In other cases, and in almost all cases in humanities and social sciences, our postdocs may have come to us with external funding of their own. So in Canada, the federal government has three agencies that fund postdoctoral researchers, and a lot of our postdocs bring their own money from those agencies. Uh, usually identifying a supervisor will have been part of the funding application process. Um, and it's not possible to hold a postdoc position unless that funding meets a certain minimum requirement. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I think it's $35,000, but I could be wrong. Make sure to check online. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. As I said, please do feel free to, uh, uh, to check out our website. Just check the department's website for any programs that you're interested in applying to. Uh, and if you can't find the information you need there, please do feel free to email sgs.international at utoronto.ca. And if we can't answer your question, we'll try to redirect you to someone who can. Thank you so much for participating today, and thank you for all your questions. Uh, we hope you found it useful.